Hi there, everyone. Let's go ahead and jump right in. It's the top of the hour. Welcome to the webinar, Harassment Prevention the Right Way by Creating a Culture that Actually Prevents Harassment. This is meant to be a very interactive webinar, so I encourage you to ask questions, talk to me throughout the webinar. I'm not one of those people that'll make you wait to the end. I think we should have a conversation. This is obviously a hot topic, can be a, a touchy topic. So by all means, participate with me, talk to me, ask questions, challenge me, uh, whatever it is. I've got my chat box open so I can see comments as they're coming through and would love to have a conversation with you today. So before we jump in, I just want to share a little bit about me in case you've not met me before. I know some people are may have been on a lot of my webinars or seen me speak. Uh, my name is Catherine Matai Sundell, and I am the CEO of Civility Partners. Civility Partners is an HR consulting firm focused on helping organizations build positive work environments. And I always like to share my story about how I came to do this work and, and get into having this, this company, Civility Partners. So over a decade ago, I was the director of human resources for a nonprofit organization, and I found myself working with a workplace bully. And this individual was an uber excessive micromanager. He yelled a lot. He made life really hard. He clearly didn't trust his team. Uh, he was very frustrating. And uh, over time, I, you know, I, I became pretty exhausted interacting with him and dealing with him. And, uh, you know, it was just a frustrating time for me. And I personally felt bullied by this individual. And so did everybody else. <laughs> but I also experienced all of the problems that he created for the organization uh, in terms of dealing with turnover. You know, as a director of HR, I spent a lot of time counseling people in my office. I spent a lot of time trying to convince the president to address this behavior. Um, and so between those two things, feeling bullied myself and also dealing with the bully as the HR manager, I, you know, I was exhausted. Um, during that time, I started getting my master's degree, though, and and had a class called the dark side of communication and that course was about all things dark in human interaction and uh, of course I had to write a paper on something dark in human interaction so I decided to write a paper on workplace bullying and you know through that writing that paper I learned a lot about workplace bullying and I realized that there's at the time there was 30 years of academic research now there's 40 years of academic research uh, on the topic from all around the world and it was very therapeutic for me to write this paper and I just kind of became obsessed with the topic and everything else I did in graduate school was on this topic of workplace bullying and uh, I just really became an expert in this topic and and in becoming an expert in workplace bullying I had to become an expert in solving workplace bullying and that ultimately means building positive work environments so uh, over time I really become an expert in building employee engagement and creating positive respectful work environments um, helping organizations have empathy, um, you know, for employees to have empathy for each other and all that good stuff. Uh, I see one person wrote that they lost audio. Is, is all good over there? We all, uh, can everybody hear me? Just want to make sure I do a, an audio check again. Okay. Everyone says they can hear me. Good deal. All right. So over over this time, I have had the wonderful experience of getting to publish articles and get cited in quite a few uh, big name places. So that's been fun. I'm a regular contributor for Forbes, uh, and Civility Partners has had a huge array of clients and. You know, where there's people, there's room for drama. So we've seen it all. We've worked with everything from Chevron, uh, which is obviously one of the largest energy companies in the world, on down to a little tiny bank in the middle of nowhere in Minnesota and everything in between. So let's talk a little bit about reality, right? So 75% of people who feel harassed at work never report it. That's a pretty shocking number. And that number comes from both SHRM and the EEOC. Both of these organizations did their own research and they both came to this number, 75% of people who feel harassed at work never report it. And that's fascinating because every organization has an anti-harassment policy and is supposedly taking steps to ensure that people don't feel harassed. Well, we have to ask ourselves why. Why then, if we all have policies, why then 
do 75% of people who feel harassed never report it? And the obvious answer is retaliation. And that's the answer we see all the time. You know, well, I'm afraid of retaliation. But I think we need to dig a little bit deeper than that easy go-to answer. Yes, they might be afraid of retaliation, but if you have a policy and your policy says retaliation is prohibited, you know, by the policy and also according to the law, why then would people still be afraid of retaliation? So the policy and the law isn't working. It's not enough to send the message that retaliation is not going to happen, right? So I think we have to dig deeper and, and try to understand, well, what exactly are people afraid of when it comes to retaliation or, or why are they still afraid of retaliation despite the fact that we have these policies? So I think there's a lot of social nuances that go into this fear of retaliation. And I wanted to give a couple examples there because I'm, I'm gonna ask you to dig a little deeper in this webinar uh, around harassment and how to prevent it. So one example of a social nuance is that there's pressure to talk logically at work and reporting harassment is a very emotional topic. So at work, we're supposed to talk logically, we're supposed to talk about solutions, we're supposed to talk about goals and metrics, and we measure things. And it's all very logical information that we're spreading at work, right? But if I feel harassed, that feels very emotional, I would be very emotional about it. And so there's this sort of social pressure to not talk about it because it goes against standard workplace communication to talk about something emotional. Um, we all know we're not supposed to cry at work and, and all that we're not supposed to yell at work. We're supposed to keep our emotions contained at work. So talking about harassment really goes against just kind of the normal way that we're supposed to communicate at work. And that's another reason beyond retaliation why people might be afraid to speak about harassment. Another example of a social nuance beyond retaliation is muted group theory. Now, this is a theory that's been around for a long time, and it's the idea that in every society, there's a powerful group and a less powerful group. And we know that, you know, in our social, this, you know, the, the world at large, there are more powerful groups and less powerful groups. Um, muted group theory is the idea that the less powerful group is muted, and if they have anything to say, they have to say it in the language of the more powerful group. Now, I want, don't want to get all political on you, but in the workplace, of course, it's more male-dominated. Women still make less money. Uh, men are still encouraged to be more assertive and better negotiators than women are. And so women who are the ones who are harassed more often than men, um, if they feel harassed, they are their voice sort of naturally muted because of the fact that the workplace is still male-dominated and the language at work is still male-dominated. So that's just one other example of a social nuance. A third example of a social nuance that would keep people from reporting harassment is your own organizational culture. So this is just a few examples of the social nuances that go into keeping what keeps people quiet. So I'm asking you again to think past retaliation, and I want you to think about um, these other sort of social things happening. So let's look at your culture. If you allow legal behaviors such as incivility and bullying to happen, then it discourages people from speaking up when harassment does happen. It sends the message that retaliation is a real possibility. So for example, we get here at Civility Partners, because I'm ultimately an expert in workplace bullying, of course we get calls from people to solve the workplace bullying problem. And what's fascinating about those calls is they never say this person just started bullying, you know, a month ago or three months ago and it's not changing. So could you help us? It's this person's been bullying for 20 years. We have a culture of bullying. Um, we have a few bullies amongst us. Can you come do a training on workplace bullying? Because we don't actually want to talk to those people. Um, and so it, it's 
you know, organizations, from my perspective, are regularly allowing workplace bullying to happen. And that's their prerogative. It's certainly legal behavior. Um, however, if you allow bullying to occur, or even in civility, then you're telling people, we care more about performance and less about behavior. And so if you were to report harassment, um, you know, you would be uh, retaliated against. So on the flip side, a workplace culture that promotes respect and civility encourages people to speak up for themselves and others um, and report it when harassment happens. So, you know, you, your culture and the way that you manage behavior really matters. Um, so how are we doing with this so far? Are you guys uh, on board with what I'm saying? Is this making sense? Just want to check in. Uh, someone asked if we'll if you'll get a copy of the slides. Um, the answer is we uh, you'll have to email me and and ask me if you want them. We don't generally just send them out. We've had some issues with uh, plagiarism and things in the past, unfortunately. So um, if you desperately want the slides, let me know. But uh, as a rule, we don't necessarily send them out to the masses. Okay, so. What we're going to talk about today then is a new look at harassment. So again, I'm going to ask you to take a different perspective and then I'm going to ask you to take a look at your culture because there's a good chance that your own organization's culture is keeping people from telling you about harassment and even promoting harassment uh, without you realizing it. So this ain't your typical sexual harassment webinar. We're not going to talk about uh, your policy. I'm not going to talk about what should be in your AB 1825 training if you're in California. You know all that stuff. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to go beyond that stuff. So let's start here. Take a look at these words on your screen. What's the difference between these words? What do you think? Let's get some conversation going. What do you think about these words? Just maybe just uh, what, what's the difference? Where are they similar? Um, do you recognize some of these words? Okay, they're all aggressive. Someone says who they're directed at. Um, could you elaborate for me who they are directed at? Let's see, they're all negative behaviors that are harmful. That's absolutely right. Uh, some of these have more of a physical aspect. That's absolutely right. Any other thoughts on these words? Some of them are actions versus um, what? Some of them are actions versus words or? Okay, some are kind of a type of behavior. Verbal, be verbal versus physical. Some might be legal and some are illegal, that's right. Some are group bullying or being aggressive over an individual, that's absolutely right. Um, action versus mindset, okay. Uh, the left side is more acceptable in the workplace. Hmm, interesting, okay, I hadn't thought about that, but that's a good observation. All right, so let me, uh, I'm gonna take you through a model that we use, or a, a spectrum, I guess, of how these behaviors are all related. And I'm hoping to uh, shock and awe you with some of the things that I say here on this slide. So at the bottom of this spectrum is incivility and unprofessionalism. And this does seem to be fairly acceptable in the workplace. You know, we don't um, have a lot of workshops and trainings on how to, you know, manage someone who's uncivil. The incivility tends to fall under that dealing with difficult people kind of a category. You know, we've all seen those webinars. Um, so incivility is essentially a microaggression. Uh, it's about minor things that we think don't necessarily matter or cause too much harm. And unprofessionalism is about doing things that go outside the norms of your own profession or, or the professional setting that you work in. Uh, the thing about incivility is even though we feel like it's a light thing and maybe it's just a little bit of rudeness and it's not that bad, uh, I encourage you to look up Christine Porath, P-O-R-A-T-H. She is the queen of incivility research and she's published quite a bit in the Harvard Business Review. Um, and she's done quite a bit of research on incivility and the damage that it causes. And uh, interestingly, it causes the same kind of damage that workplace bullying does, though of course to a lesser degree. But uh, her name is Christine Porath, P-O-R-A-T-H. 
And uh, so she found, for example, that something like, uh, you know, 80 percent of her survey respondents said that they purposely uh, avoided somebody who was uncivil. Eighty percent of her survey respondents said that they purposely uh, sort of lost their loyalty to the organization or worked less on the day that they were at the receiving end of an uncivil encounter. So incivility is quite distracting. Uh, and in fact, when people are uncivil to us, we really seem to remember it um, more so than positive interactions. So, so incivility is also damaging. So up the chain there then is bullying. So if we allow incivility and unprofessionalism to occur, then it can certainly turn into workplace bullying. And the way workplace bullying works is you do have these initial acts of incivility, these initial microaggressions. And you know, over time, if nobody ever addresses those microaggressions, then it turns into bullying because the individual who's doing those micro microaggressions starts to feel like, um, you know, this seems to be okay. I get what I need when I act this way. I feel powerful when I do it. So they start to feel like it's okay and it becomes worse and worse. It becomes more and more frequent and more and more aggressive and it turns into bullying. Um, we can stick conflict in there sort of in between incivility and bullying um, because conflict is different than bullying, right? So conflict is when you have two people who disagree, but they both feel heard. Bullying is where one person is acting so aggressively that the other person's being squashed out. Um, and conflict, you know, they're, while they're different, conflict can certainly also turn into bullying if allowed to go on. Eventually, one party in the conflict may sort of rise above the other person uh, through aggressive behavior. Now, under this category of workplace bullying is these other words, discrimination, harassment, mobbing, and hazing. So I'm going to say this a couple times, and I hope if you're taking notes, you write this down. Bullying and harassment are the same behaviors. Bullying and harassment are the same behaviors. So the only difference is that bullying is legal and harassment is illegal. So think of this, your employee comes to you and says it's a hostile work environment. To them, it feels hostile. And so they use that phrase. It feels like this person is hostile. You conduct an investigation and you learn that there is no illegal behavior and it's not harassment. And so therefore, your report will say it is not a hostile work environment. But that's so silly to me because if it's bullying, the person still feels like it's a hostile work environment. We so yes, we have to draw a line, you know, between the two because of the law. But in the end, we should stop drawing a line between the two because the behaviors are the same. Um, uh, mobbing and hazing are are essentially group bullying. So these two behaviors are relatively the same as well. The only difference is that hazing has kind of a time stamp on it. So hazing is about indoctrinating somebody into a group, right? And once that person is indoctrinated, then the hazing stops versus mobbing, which is uh, group bullying with no end date. And of, of course, mobbing and harassment can be this one in the same, for example, you have one woman who joins a fire department and she's the only woman uh, and she gets sexually harassed by the males at the, at the fire department, uh, that would be mobbing, but of course it's also harassment. So then at the other end of the spectrum is workplace violence. And um, I'll just say this, according to OSHA, all that has to happen for there to be violence is fear at the other end. Violence is about intimidation, verbal threats, um, you know, people are afraid. So bullying is workplace violence. They are one and the same as well. So let me give you an example. I coached uh, an individual who was uh, bullying others. And one of the things that he would do is stand up in staff meetings and lean over the table and get everybody sort of described that he got really puffy and his eyes were bulging out of his head and he just had this really sort of aggressive demeanor when he would stand up out of his chair at staff meetings and then he'd lean over the table and he'd 
tell somebody that they were stupid or that their idea was stupid. Um, there's no touching there. He wasn't touching anybody, but everybody in the room was afraid, particularly the person he was sort of leaning over. That counts as workplace violence. That is workplace violence. Um, and actually the reason that they ended up reaching out for a coach, just to finish that story, was uh, this individual let his aggression get the better of him and he would engage in angry outbursts quite often. And one time he yelled at someone so kind of crazily and angrily that the person told his friend that he uh, was having a panic attack while he was being yelled at. And he told his friend that his tongue was swelling up while he was being yelled at and he felt frozen and his heart was beating really fast. He literally had a physical panic attack while he was being yelled at. So there was no touching, but that was the trigger where the HR uh, manager finally said, okay, this is crossing into violence. We're gonna get you a coach. And so I coached him, but, but that's what I'm talking about. He'd been allowed to yell like that for years. It's just someone finally had a breakdown and that's what inspired the organization to address it. And I don't think that's right. I think it needed to be addressed quite, you know, long before that, um, especially if the organization really and truly wants to prevent things like harassment. You know, as long as you allow that person to essentially harass everyone, nobody's gonna report harassment to you. So uh, as I said, harassment and bullying are one and the same. So I just wanted to highlight that a little bit more. So both harassment and bullying are about abuse of power. Both harassment and bullying are repeated acts unless it's so severe or egregious enough that, uh, for example, in harass, you know, if we're talking about sexual harassment, generally it has to be repeated uh, it, unless it's something like rape, you know, that's so egregious that uh, that's sexual harassment, but it's also a felony. Um, bullying also has to be repeated. And in fact, researchers say that bullying has to happen uh, about once a week for a period of six months before they'll kind of say, okay, that's bullying. Um, both of these behaviors, you know, intention is irrelevant. So the law essentially says that it doesn't matter matter whether the the harassment is intentional or not, it's still harassment. So if you were to sue an organization for harassment, you wouldn't have to prove that the person intentionally was harassing you. You just have to prove that it happened. So intention is irrelevant. With workplace bullying, uh, intention is also irrelevant. The person at the receiving end feels bullied and it doesn't matter whether it's intentional or not. And I will just say as a coach who specializes in coaching workplace bullies specifically, uh, it is not intentional at all. Workplace bullying is absolutely not intentional. People who bully actually just have very low social and emotional intelligence. Uh, both harassment and bullying ruins lives. And then here's the only real difference. Harassment's illegal and bullying's legal. How are we feeling about this? You guys, you guys with me uh, on this comparison? Any other thoughts on this comparison? I gotta make sense. How are we feeling about this? I'm gonna take a sip of water while you answer. How can we stop both? Don't worry, that is the next section of the webinar. We will get there. I've got 10, 10 steps for you. Um, someone says it provides a more clear perspective. Uh, si finally, someone's addressing, addressing this. Thank you. Um, have you recommendations for books on bullying? Why, yes, I've written two books on workplace bullying. We have a third one coming out here in a few weeks, hopefully. Um, so one book that I wrote is called Back Off. It's for people who feel bullied. And my other book is Seeking Civility. And that book is for uh, leaders and uh, managers in HR to solve bullying. All right, I'm glad you guys are with me. So just to kind of beat a dead horse on this whole harassment versus bullying thing. Uh-oh, what happened to my slide? There we go. Um, you know, here you have this guy who is yelling at one particular group of people, that is harassment. But if this person yells at everyone, then he's perfectly legal to do that. So bullying, all it is, is equal opportunity harassment. Um, let's see. 
here's a question. I feel that there's one person that is a big bully, but he is high up in the organization, so I don't know what to do. Uh, that's a great, great point. Um, have you spoken to your HR department about it yet? Um, if you are HR, I recommend going to the person above that individual and talking with him or her about it. Um, again, I coach these individuals, so you can go to your, uh, whoever you need to go to with a uh, solution. Let's see, adults often think that bullying is only applicable to minors. That's absolutely right, uh, though that is changing a little bit. I think, um, you know, or I've noticed over the last decade, you know, when I first started this work, uh, it was really hard to get people to pay attention to this. And when I tell people I was an expert in workplace bullying at networking events, for example, they'd kind of just go, uh, "That what is that? I don't, you know, they kind of poke fun. Oh, do you take people out back and beat them up, you know? Um, but now when I say I'm a workplace bullying expert, people go, oh, gosh, that's really needed. I'm so glad there's people like you out there. So it's been an interesting uh, paradigm shift. Uh, I am not sure what happened. There was a slide in there, but that's okay. We'll move on. Okay, so next up, I want to talk about a social, the kind of the social phenomenon of harassment, bullying, incivility, whatever you want to call it, with these negative behaviors, and then we'll move into talking about 10 solutions. Um, so there is, uh, of course, the perpetrator is part of the model. So the perpetrator, uh, again, in the case of workplace bullying, um, what I know for sure is that people who engage in workplace bullying are uh, really lacking social and emotional intelligence. And they also live in fear of being seen as incompetent. And so they bully as a way to sort of show people that they are competent without realizing that it's doing the opposite and uh, making sure that, uh, you know, all it's doing is solidifying people to seeing them as incompetent. Um, so that's what I know about workplace bullying. I suspect because I believe that harassment and bullying are essentially one and the same, that anybody who engages in something like sexual harassment is in a similar case. Um, we know for sure that people who engage in harassment are also looking for power, you know, doing, engaging in harassing behaviors, um, uh, makes them feel powerful. And they feel like it helps them get their needs met. Uh, I got a question here. Have you ever had a bully who refused to accept their behavior and make long-term changes? If so, what did the company do? That is a great question. So I'll just share a little bit about how, how my coaching works. I have not had that happen to me uh, as a coach because I will not take on coaching clients unless the organization has given a consequence. So so what has to happen is the organization has to say, you're perceived as too abrasive and that needs to change. Uh, and if it doesn't change, you know, we'll have to let you go or demote you or transfer you or whatever the consequence is. And then they can say, but we do have a resource for you because we do see you as valuable and uh, we got you a coach. So um, from there, you know, now I have their attention as the coach because of this consequence looming over their head. Uh, and then I do interviews where I interview people who they work with, uh, whose names they give me, and then I can show them the feedback. And honestly, really and truly, because they really desire to be, be seen as competent, uh, they get this 15 page document from me that it, that explains how incompetent they're perceived. You know, all these people are saying all these things about essentially how incompetent they are at building relationships and at leadership. Um, and that really motivates them to change because they want to be competent. So, so that's, you know, I've not had somebody refuse coaching with me. Uh, bullies are insecure that need to feel valid and empowered. That's right. They, they live in this crazy fear of, uh, you know, being seen as incompetent and they, that, that's what drives their behavior. I have someone who refuses to take coaching and is high up. Yeah, so the, the reason he's refusing is he hasn't been given a consequence. So th the only way that person is going to accept coaching, uh, off, you know, up front is to have the consequence laid out. If you don't change, here's the consequence. And then once you get coaching in there, then they start to engage in intra or, sorry, intrinsic motivation uh, because, you know, they realize that people really see them as incompetent so um, but he's he's going to refuse it as long as there's no consequence okay so the target is also a part of the 
uh, the model here. So I'm not saying anybody at the receiving end of these behaviors deserves it or did anything to bring it on themselves, but but bullying, harassment, incivility, discrimination, all of these things are ultimately a relationship that's formed between the perpetrator and the target. Um, what we do know about targets is they're often pretty high performers as are harassers and bullies. Um, be, you know, and that, that's one of the reasons that bullying is often just overlooked and harassment is often just overlooked. This person is valuable, we'll just let it go and hopefully there's no legal repercussions, right? Um, but targets are also high performers, hence they're threatening for the bully. They don't, uh, you know, they that, that it sort of threatens their ability to appear as competent. So their relationship is one of a power imbalance, as we talked about before, but organizational members are also part of this. So we really often focus on the, the perpetrator and we focus on the organization as a whole, but we don't necessarily focus on the organization's members. So a lot of people will call organizational members witnesses or bystanders. I don't like those words because they feel pretty accidental, right? So I could be a bystander to a car accident. There's nothing I can do. But if I'm at work and I watch harassment happening and I never speak up about it, then that makes me a reinforcer right? I'm making a choice day in and day out not to say anything. So I am reinforcing the behavior. So what I'm doing is supporting the person who's doing the harassment and I'm damaging the target. And on the other side, we have the organization's norms and culture. So again, the organization itself, by not stepping in when there's incivility, by not requiring people to live the core values, by not measuring people on their core values, um, you know, they're allowing these sorts of behaviors to happen. Uh, there's also a ton of research on the organizational factors that would allow aggression to thrive in an organization. And some of those factors are things like bureaucracy, uh, high competition, when you have an organization full of really smart people, when you have an organization full of long time employees, um, you know, all of those things can allow aggression to occur. And of course, all of those organizational norms are supporting the perpetrator, perpetrator and damaging the target. Meanwhile, the, the perpetrator is damaging the organization and the members. So again, if you allow things like incivility and bullying, which are legal behaviors, but if you allow those to thrive, then you're sending the message you don't care. People won't come forward when illegal things happen because they're getting the message that you don't care. Um, you're certainly at risk for litigation because, you know, again, employees don't distinguish between a hostile work environment and if whether that's a legal term or not. And of course, it's all bad for the organization. Turnover goes up and productivity goes down. So this is a quote that I love. If you haven't watched it, Johnny Taylor uh, did a speech in front of the California legislature because California's legislature is looking at policies and the things that they need to do inside the legislature to eradicate sexual harassment inside the legislature. And how do you know how do we keep uh, congressmen from sleeping with their interns. That's what they're trying to solve. And so Johnny Taylor, who is our new CEO of SHRM, he offered a testimony and he talked all about culture. And I love this quote, with a healthy workplace culture, when sexual harassment is observed or experienced, the community takes over and shuts it down collectively with a message that this behavior will not be tolerated here by anyone at any level. So Johnny's testimony, he's saying, don't pass any more laws. We don't need any more policies. It's already illegal. Passing a law is not going to solve, you know, the problem with sexual harassment in the legislature. What you have to do is focus on culture. So I just love that he said that if you haven't seen it, you can just look it up on Sherm's website. They have the video. It's only like 17 minutes and it's just a really great speech. Uh, someone else says, love this. So I, I do too. So what Johnny was saying is that uh, by creating the right kind of culture, you're essentially creating peer pressure. So if you have a positive workplace culture, then when negative things happen, it's more obvious and people will uh, speak up. So right now what we're seeing in the news is that you know all of this 
advice around harassment prevention is policy and training, policy and training, policy and training. And there's like some sense out there that that's going to change the culture of your organization. But all policy and training does is check the box. And all that's happened with our training, especially in California, is it beca it's become very focused on the law. Um, it, you know, it's all about what AB 1825 says and how to define harassment. And it's, it's all very technical. That's not going to create a positive work environment. All that's going to do is educate managers and supervisors on how to stay out of trouble. Um, so what we need to do instead is rethink this advice that we're looking at. You have to have policy and procedures. Yes, um, your leadership has to be on board with creating a positive work environment. And then you have to push on behavior of the, your organization's members. And that's how you have culture are these three things. So let's jump into some action items for you. Let's get to the good stuff. So option number one, or a piece of advice number one for harassment prevention is to adjust your training. So yes, you're, you're doing training, but I recommend that you think about it a little bit differently. So if your training doesn't already do this, you want to focus your training around positive behaviors. What does respect even mean and look like? Um, look at your core values. What do your core values even mean? What do they look like? And, and how do you know that people are living them? Your training should include bystander responsibilities. So I suspect if you're in California, for example, and your AB 1825 trainer uh, is there, I'm sure they're saying things like, you know, bystanders, you should step in. Everybody should report it to HR if they witness negative behavior. Um, and that's good. That's a nice first step. But teach them how to step in. Bystanders need to step in in the moment. So if we're all in a staff meeting and we see an inappropriate joke right there before our eyes in the staff meeting, everyone should feel comfortable to say, hey, John, that felt inappropriate. Let's not go there and then move on. So bystanders have to be taught the language to use. How do you step in? And then everybody should be accountable to stepping in. So the organization needs to take a stand and say, we expect everyone to step in. And if you don't, then you're a guilty party as well. So you're really creating a see something, say something culture. Um, for once, the government uh, came out with a, a good, <laughs> something good that we, that we can use over and over again. Um, do I offer sexual harassment training is a question I see. I do indeed. I absolutely, I absolutely do. Um, okay. Uh, so, so, what I'm saying is that everyone in your organization needs training on communication skills, leadership, collaboration, respect, you know, all of these things that you need from people. And assertiveness is a positive workplace kind of a, a behavior. We all should learn how to speak up when something makes us uncomfortable. Um, let's see, I we have a manager who has an old view of what he says and he uses racial slurs and sexist comments, uh, then he, and he has a bad attitude when you correct him, then that's a performance problem. Um, again, by, by those things happening and he, you know, the rest of the workforce doesn't know that you've spoken to him about his behavior. All the workforce knows is that he makes those racial slurs and sexist comments and it's being allowed. That's all they know. So, they're never going to tell you if it gets worse. You know, if somebody's act being really truly sexually harassed, you'll never know about it as long as you allow that guy to act that way. Um, so when he gets a bad attitude, that's his problem, but it's a performance issue. You need to have a conversation with him, let him know it needs to change. He's not allowed to act that way anymore. And if it continues, he'll be disciplined up to and including termination, period, end of story. It's a performance problem and it needs to be managed as such. Do not allow those things to happen in your organization. Um, leaders and managers on the flip side, uh, they also need, in addition to all of that other training on positive work uh, behaviors, they need to know how to set expectations for behavior. Um, they need to know how to manage these negative behaviors. They need to know how to coach behavior and performance. So uh, back to your comment about this guy who's making racial slurs and comments, um, he, whoever he reports to should be stepping in and again, uh, giving him, you know, co coaching and, and sending him down the performance process. Um, 
all of your leaders and managers need training on creating a positive culture. So for example, when I am asked to do sexual harassment training, and when I am asked to do workplace bullying training, uh, my training does talk about what you know, what that is and what it means, but ultimately it talks about this, creating a positive culture. So I train managers and leaders to go back to their teams, create action items and action plans around creating a positive culture. Uh, we figure out ways for them to ensure they're living the core values. So the training is about here's what's bad, but ultimately here's what we want from you instead and here's how you do that. So you gotta take that second step Action item number two is to do a climate assessment. And I'll just say that ignorance is not bliss. So with all of this stuff in the news around sexual harassment, if you have not done a climate assessment uh, as part of your harassment prevention efforts, then I recommend that you do. And um, you, know, you could say, well, I don't really wanna know the answers, but if that's how you're feeling, then you're definitely someone who should be doing that with your organization. And I would recommend including questions such as, you know, if uh, having people rate the extent to which they feel comfortable um, stepping in and, and talking to somebody in person about inappropriate behaviors. And I would, you know, have a, a question in there, or a statement that people rate around whether or not people feel uh, comfortable going to HR. I would have a statement in there where people are rating how much they trust their coworkers. So, um, you know, asking questions that really help you understand if your harassment prevention efforts that you have so far, um, are they working and what else could you be doing? Uh, someone's asking a question, what is a climate assessment? So climate assessments are uh, surveys that you can send out in your organization that would help you understand you know, the climate of the organization, whether or not it's a positive and engaging work environment or not. Um, Civility Partners does climate assessments. If you're interested in talking more about that with me offline, happy to, to talk with you more about our process. Um, but when we do climate assessments, you know, we do uh, a serve an online survey that everybody takes, and then we also do interviews as part of it so that we can really understand what's going on in the organization. Do you recommend doing the assessment internally or using an outside vendor? That's a great question. Uh, I recommend doing it with an outside vendor. If you do a climate if you sorry, if you do a climate assessment internally, um, what'll happen is people will be afraid to speak up and they won't be totally honest. They'll, they'll give you the light version of what's really going on. If you have an outside vendor do it, uh, people are much more honest uh, because they feel like this is going somewhere outside of the organization where my organization won't know what I said. Um, and again, we do interviews as part of our climate assessment and, and we're really able to collect a, a lot of really good information through that process by assuring people that you know what they say is totally confidential. All right, did we get all the questions answered? All good? Okay, your action item number three is to hold managers accountable to positive climate survey scores. So if you start doing climate assessments or climate surveys, or even employee engagement surveys or job satisfaction surveys, whatever kind of survey you do, um, hold managers for you know department by department accountable to scores and if you have managers who have low scores then that becomes a performance improvement uh, piece that they need to participate in they go on a performance improvement plan and the manager is accountable and responsible for creating a positive work environment and that means that you have to train them on how to do that and require them to create action items around your core values so let me give you some ideas on some action items that your managers could be doing around your core values to create a positive work environment. Uh, one is to audit your practices against the core values. So what I'm suggesting is if you're in HR, you could go to your managers or your department heads and say, you know, I'd really like people to start living the core values. Let's have you um, sort of audit your practices here in your team and see if they're, uh-oh, people are saying they've lost audio. Can you guys hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay, 
Perfect. We're back on. I hate when that happens. <laughs> okay. Someone says it's going in and out. All right. Looks like we're back on. Okay. My apologies for that. I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, someone else is saying it's in and out. Okay. All right. So, so uh, again, audit's kind of a scary word, and I'm not saying this involves some big formal process and hours and hours of work. I'm just suggesting that managers essentially sit down with their staff and say, you know, here are our core values. Uh, let's talk about whether or not we live those core values in our department and in what ways are we living these core values and in what ways are we not? You know, where can we improve? So, for example, if one of your core values in your organization is, you know, teamwork or collaboration, then the manager can talk with their team about that. Do we really collaborate? Are there ways where we could be collaborating better? You know, how is our communication? And let's sort of audit our collaboration to see if there's ways to improve. So that's one idea for keeping your core values alive. Another idea for your managers is to create lunch and learns around your core values. So, um, for example, if you have five core values, each department can choose a core value, maybe some, if you have more than five departments, uh, some values might go twice, but then the department works together to create a lunch and learn around one of the core values. So if respect is one of your core values, then, uh, you know, the accounting department creates a, a lunch and learn around respect. And it's just a chance for them to stretch themselves a little bit, a chance for them to have some fun and for uh, everybody else to kind of interact with the accounting department and learn a little bit about respect. So it's a cheap and kind of fun way to keep your core values alive. Another fun idea might be to hold spirit days um, to celebrate different values. Think back to your high school days. Um, how can you sort of celebrate your core values? So maybe you choose a, a core value uh, each month and then sort of celebrate that core value. So these are just small ideas for keeping your core values alive. Are these three action items themselves going to prevent harassment? No, but what they're gonna do is start pushing on your culture, making it more positive, and that ultimately is, you know, that's the ultimate solution to harassment prevention. Uh, action item number four is to regularly reward positive behavior. So some more fun ideas, you know, post comments on social media. If your company has a Facebook account, post comments about it. Um, create a wall of success where you can acknowledge people for their good deeds. Um, show off behavior at a staff meeting. So if somebody uh, does something really exemplary or that really, you know, is about your core values, then talk about them, acknowledge them in a staff meeting. So, you know, people are being rewarded and their behavior is being reinforced. Action item number five to harassment prevention is to actively create equity. So interestingly enough, you know, again, our harassment prevention is always focused around training and policy, training and policy. But I would uh, put out there that if your males and females are making different amounts for the same job, you're not actually preventing harassment. If you're not auditing your diversity and if you're not focused on recruiting a diverse group of people, then you're not preventing harassment. If you're not um, you know, focused on a diverse, inclusive work environment, then you're not preventing harassment. So, you know, if men and women make something different for the same job, you're saying that men are more powerful and women are less than. So part of harassment prevention is auditing these kinds of things that we often think of outside of harassment or as separate. So D&I and harassment prevention honestly go hand in hand. Step number six, bring your core values to life. So, you know, again, requiring and empowering employees to live your core values is an important part to harassment prevention. And adding your core values to your strategic plan is an important part of harassment prevention. So your organization has a strategic plan around, um, you know, increasing the number of customers, increasing revenue, um, you know, growing, whatever it is. But do you have... A, a section in your strategic plan that's around your culture. And if you don't, that's a mistake and it needs to be added. So let me share a story with you about a company that really and truly requires and empowers their employees to live their core values. I am a LinkedIn learning course author. 
and uh, I get the pleasure of working with these individuals at LinkedIn Learning, and they are so fun. I love going there. So the way it works is that I write the scripts to my courses here at my desk in San Diego. And then when they're all ready, I get to go to LinkedIn Learning's campus in Santa Barbara and spend a couple days with them filming, filming my course in front of a green screen. And they have a very fun, respectful, cool culture. And of course they do, you know, they're a tech company, they're creatives. Um, so they're, they have fun anyway. Um, but one thing I notice, for example, when I go is that there's all these people in the room uh, when I'm filming. So it's it's me, it's my producer, it's a director, it's a makeup person, it's a, I'm not sure what the title is of the other person who's scrolling the teleprompter, but there's four or five people in the room, you know, as I'm filming my course. <clears throat> and what happens is, um, you know, the director's the one who's supposed to be directing and, and telling me what to do. But these other people in the room often have ideas and i've always been fascinated by the fact that someone other than the director will say well i have an idea why don't we try having catherine you know say it this way and everybody's looks at this person and says okay let's give it a try or they'll talk about it so they really respect each other's ideas and it's just really neat to watch um so wanted to share a couple stories about living the core values so two different women have told me two different stories, but their stories are similar, and I think that's interesting. Um, so we had these two women at LinkedIn Learning, both working with two different course authors who were male. These course authors were a lot like the guy that we were talking about earlier who makes racial comments and he's old school and all that good stuff. So this, these two different course authors were making these inappropriate comments at LinkedIn Learning and these two different women told this course author, please stop making these comments. Well, he didn't stop making the comments. And so after a little while, both of these women asked this course author to leave one of LinkedIn Learning's core values is act like an owner. So these two women acted like an owner and they were empowered to do that by the organization. The organization you know, says, we want you to act like an owner. Here's what that means. And these women took it upon themselves to ask a course author to leave. That cost LinkedIn Learning money because they had to go find a new course author and um, pay someone else to rewrite the course and refilm it and all this stuff. So, but they, they felt empowered because one of their core values is act like an owner. So that's what I'm talking about. We, you have these core values that somebody some, somewhere along the line at your organization created. Use them for harassment prevention. If everybody's acting in accordance with your core values, they're not harassing people. So again, the ultimate harassment prevention is creating a positive work environment. Someone says that's empowering. What a great workplace. Indeed, I love going there. I love going there. So action item number seven then is to address all negative behavior, even that legal stuff. So again, if it's incivility, you still have to address it. Um, if it's workplace bullying, you still have to address it. Again, if you don't address it, you are telling your organization they will they should not report illegal behaviors to you because it doesn't matter to you you are sending the wrong message so early intervention prevents future damage if somebody's acting out like this individual that we were talking about earlier who's making racial slurs that needs to stop now um, and it's a performance problem it needs to be addressed as such so here's your job in hr your job is to make these people see that their behavior is damaging make them care that it has to change and then give them help. So those are the three steps. So let me, uh, I wanna give you a little more insight into that. And I know a couple other people had made comments about somebody who doesn't notice that their behavior is bad or they get defensive when you try to call them out. Um, let me just kind of talk you through that a little bit. Let me take a sip of water here. So often the assumption about these kinds of individuals that that I've been uh, people seeing people commenting on here is that their behavior is intentional that they're fully aware that it's damaging and that they can't change um, but the reality is that it's unintentional they are fully unaware that their behavior is so damaging and they 100% can change I've been coaching these people for a while and they do change and it's and it's a cool process 
So here are some scripts for you. Make them see. That's step number one. And so, you know, this this is kind of how you address those people who deny that their behavior is so bad, right? So you could say, we've had a steady stream of complaints from coworkers about their experiences interacting with you. We don't see this with other managers. This is not acceptable and it cannot continue. We need to have you turn this around. And then, of course, as you some of you have said, they'll deny it. They get a bad attitude. They say, it's not that bad. What's your problem? And then you'll say, I'm not going to engage in a fact battle with you. I wasn't there, but there is one fact. Your behavior is perceived as too abrasive, and that one particular fact has to change. So you're not going to engage with them in a fact battle or argue with them about whether or not their behavior is inappropriate or not. You're just going to say, I am hearing this is happening, and me hearing about it has to change. That has to stop. How do you feel about these two statements? especially those of you that were saying you've got some people that uh, aren't listening. Someone says, I feel empowered. I'm going to use this. Other thoughts on these two sentences. Uh, the last time I did this webinar, people were furiously writing these down. So let me know if you um, need me to go back to the other slide. Someone says, very helpful. Oftentimes I'm out of words and they want to argue with their side. Someone says, worth a try. Yes, I'd like to write it down. Uh, let's see, short and clear. How do you get leadership on board? Um, so how do you get leadership on board? Well, I would recommend uh, spending the time talking with leadership about how bullying and harassment are one and the same, essentially. Uh, so if you can, you know, if you could say, hey, if I was telling you that this individual was telling uh, racial slurs all the time, making, making sexual jokes and inappropriately touching women, would you be interested in putting a stop to it? And the CEO will probably say yes. And then you can say, well, this person's behavior is no different and it needs to stop. It's right on the line of harassment and it needs to stop. Um, leaders also really like, uh, you know, facts and numbers. So if you can show them the numbers. We actually have an article that's on the ROI of engagement. I'm working on an article for Forbes that's on the cost of turnover and negative work environments. Um, but if you can show them kind of some of this information that this is so damaging, I might also recommend pulling out an Excel sheet and figuring it out for yourself. How much time have you spent dealing with this? How, you know, what's, what's the cost been for your organization so far? Uh, someone says, would you show the previous screen? So yes, I will do that. Okay, let me go up. There's a lot of comments that came through. Okay, so we got the question, how, did, how do you get leadership on board? Uh, someone says, this feels too general. I would follow up with examples. Uh, absolutely, I, I agree with that. So the, the idea behind this script, though, is that, you know, they're going to, even if you say, you know, yesterday, uh, Susan said that you yelled at her in a staff meeting. Um, they're going to say, no, I didn't, or Susan deserved it, or Susan didn't do her job, and so I was angry. You know, so they'll, they'll try to justify the fact that they yelled at Susan yesterday. Um, and so if you keep it short and simple, it's just, I'm hearing that this is happening. It doesn't matter whether you, know, whether you agree it's happening or not. I keep hearing about it, and that has to change. And you know, that, so it becomes about you know, the things that uh, that you're hearing, that's what has to change because you don't know, you weren't there, right? Um, what happens when someone's perception of someone else's behavior as abrasive or aggressive is rooted in implicit bias? Ooh, that's a good, profound question. Um, I think uh, the, your question speaks to the importance of having empathy at work, right? And training people on having positive work behaviors. So um, we all have implicit bias. If you do training around implicit bias and you do training around empathy and communication, um, then it allows people to understand each other a little bit better. So, you know, certainly culture, um, you know, plays a role in how we perceive people. And maybe one culture is, you know, more direct than another culture, for example. So th your question really speaks to how deep harassment goes and that it has to go beyond training on the law and a policy. It's really about changing how people think and interact with each other at work.
I hope that answers your questions. Let's see. We can use this verbiage, but it's important to have leadership on board. Uh, that's that's right. So you know, coaching's not uh, it's it's not a quick fix. It's a process. It requires that leaders be on board. It requires that this person's been given a consequence. So you know, if your leadership's not interested in giving the the bully, for example, or the harasser a consequence, then you know, I wouldn't coach them. You know, they, they ha there has to be a consequence at first. Um, and I would also say this, you know, this conversation that I'm talking about where you're saying, you know, the, here's the facts, you know, that, that I'm hearing these complaints and that has to change. But then you follow up with, but I found you a resource and this person's going to coach you and ensure that you are able to change because we value you. So it's not a negative conversation. It's a, this has to change, but we found you a resource because we do value you. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it becomes a positive experience. And every individual that I've coached initially was a little unsure, but once we started down the process of coaching, they really loved it. I've had so much positive feedback at the end of the coaching. It's not a bad experience. It's not a punishment. It's, it's leadership coaching, it's executive coaching. You know, it's, it's something that many leaders around the world are doing all the time. Um, let's see, I, we have said these things. I believe the organization hasn't drawn a line in the sand because the person achieves their numbers. So that's what I see all the time, uh, you know, that this individual is a performer. They outperform everybody. Um, and so the organization's willing to overlook their behavior. But again, you know, when you're talking to leadership about addressing this person's behavior, tell them the behavior is borderline harassment if it's workplace bullying. Uh, let them know that even though they're achieving their numbers, they're costing the organization a lot. So if this is a salesperson who's bringing in, you know, $500,000 a year or a million dollars a year, but they're costing the organization in $500,000 a year, then you know, that that doesn't make sense. Um, and the problem is that what they bring in goes into QuickBooks, right? But what they're costing and turnover and distraction and sick days, that's not a line item in your budget. So it's hard to look at it. It's not a real cost in your QuickBooks account, right? Um, and so that's where it gets difficult. So you have to make a compelling argument that even though they're achieving their numbers, they're actually costing the organization quite a bit. And in the end, if they're achieving their numbers, don't you just want to make them more effective anyways? Like if they're if they're an effective salesperson and they're achieving their numbers, why not make them even better? Why not? You know, um, do you have an outline or summary slide that lists the steps? I understand you won't just distribute the entire presentation. Sure, absolutely. Uh, or, you know, I'll give you an email address at the end and uh, you can shoot over to that email address what you're looking for. We're happy to uh, happy to send what you need over. Um, I agree. Address the issue, but also provide a solution. OK, perfect. Um, I've had some situations when some people put every hard conversation in as discrimination, sort of a victim mentality. Uh, I've seen that as well. Um, so when I do training sometimes on workplace bullying, for example, um, people will often come to me on the break or as I'm going around, you know, talking with tables during an exercise, someone or four or five people inevitably will confide in me that although the training's nice, they know nothing will ever change because bullying's been going on for years. And of course, my training's not going to solve it. And I tell them, I agree with you. And, uh, you know, your organization has to step in. So, um, you know, another reason training is totally useless unless it's coupled with all of these cultural action items. Um, I see it all the time. You know, the people say, thanks for coming here, but it's a waste. It, nothing's going to change. And what they're saying is the culture has to change. So training is useless without culture, too. All right. So you made them see, right? So then the next step is make them care. And that's giving them clear information about what has to change. So you must change in these following ways. And failure to do so will result in. And that's how you make them care, giving them a consequence. And then you get them help. So you say you have to change. If you don't change, uh, you'll be demoted. 
but not to worry, we don't want to have to demote you. We value you. And so we have gotten you some help. We've got maybe an internal mentor. That's one idea or specialized coaching. That's the other idea. So just to give you a little bit more insight on the coaching that I do, um, my coaching program is based on fight or flight. And what I do when I'm coaching workplace bullies is talk with them about this simple concept that we all know, fight or flight, right? And I talk about the fact that they're creating anxiety in people. And so people are fighting and fleeing. They're either not speaking up in staff meetings or avoiding the individual that's fleeing, or they are um, fighting. They've gone to HR and filed a hostile work environment complaint, for example. And so then it becomes around changing perceptions. It becomes around, um, you know, how do we get people to reduce their anxiety so that they can work with you and you can be more effective? Um, let's see. I don't know what I would that I would say not to worry. We want them to take this seriously. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> yes, gotcha. All right. So, um, so, so the coaching is based on fight or flight, and it, there's this whole model that I go through with the individual, um, and then the coaching becomes around asking these two questions. What are they anxious about, and how can you help them reduce their anxiety? Um, I've had 100% success with the individuals I've coached. I'm actually certified in a coaching methodology tailored specifically for what we call abrasive leaders or people who engage in bullying and harassment. Um, the, the certification that I have was created by a woman named Dr. Laura Crashaw, who's been coaching these individuals for 40 years. Uh, she's coached over 500 abrasive leaders and has really found the exact process to follow. And I follow her process to a T and it really, really works. It's pretty cool. I love coaching. It's my favorite job out of everything I do here at Civility Partners. Um, if you have somebody who you feel like needs some coaching, uh, let me know. I'm happy to, to talk with you about it. Okay, action item number eight is to implement a healthy workplace policy and show zero tolerance for that bad behavior. So yes, you have an anti-harassment policy. You may even have an anti-workplace bullying policy, uh, but I recommend that you also have a healthy workplace policy. So again, stop focusing on what you don't want and instead start focusing on what you do want. Start focusing on respect and a positive work environment and that's the ultimate harassment prevention. Um, and I recommend that you involve your employees in creating this ha healthy work environment um, policy. So this is a question that I ask when I do trainings with, with companies. Uh, so as part of my training, we do this exercise where I ask them, how would you like to be treated by your peers and managers? And then I break the, them up into groups of three or four and uh, have them, you know, for about 10 minutes, kind of brainstorm their answer to this question. And then I go through and collect all of their answers and I collect their answers publicly so that they can all hear what each group said. And what's cool about it is a lot of people all say the same things. So, you know, all all of the groups essentially say the same 10 or 15 answers. Uh, I've done this this exercise, asked this question in trainings in a huge array of companies from universities to ER nurses to a manufacturing company. Um, you know, all uh, people of all walks of life, and they always say about the same 10 or 15 things. So I have come to learn that humans really and truly do want the same 10 or 15 things. We all want to be valued at work. We all want to laugh once in a while. We all want to feel appreciated. Um, these are all the answers I get. So if you collect those uh, publicly, then your organizational members can kind of see that they all want the same things. And honestly, there's a real sort of sigh of relief um, as people realize that they all want the same things. So then you can collect these answers, put them into themes, and include the answers in your healthy workplace policy. Um, so even if you don't take my advice and you don't have a healthy workplace policy, I would encourage you to, at the very least, do this exercise. So can I get some commitment to do the exercise to get the conversation started on a positive work environment inside your organization? Who's going to do it? I've got some yes, I'm ins. I've got some yeses with exclamations. I think it's great. Absolutely. 
Yes. All right. Perfect. So, um, and by the way, we have a healthy workplace policy. If you're interested, uh, we can, we have a template that we can send over. Um, it defines workplace bullying later in the policy, but it is really focused on the healthy workplace. Someone says, I'm going to do it Monday. Perfect. So send me an email uh, after you do the exercise. I'd love to hear how it goes. All right, so number nine, uh, offer many designated channels for complaints. And this is a piece of advice you've seen before, uh, probably, but wanted to throw it out there here too. Uh, I think that um, you know, the more channels you can offer up, the more likely people are to talk, to, uh, talk about harassment with you. Uh, someone says, I'd love the policy template. All right, so I'm gonna give you an email address at the end of the webinar. If you would do me a favor and email that individual, he will send over your policy to you. Uh, so many have many designated channels and then ultimately action item number 10 is to commit to being an example yourself. And um, that sounds a little cheesy sometimes, but it's true. You know, if again, if you're not stepping in when you see negative behaviors, there's no way anybody else is going to step in when they see negative behaviors. Um, so really and truly, you, you have to do the things that you need everybody else to do. So if there's bullying or incivility and you're not stepping in, um, you're setting the wrong example. Again, nobody else is going to step in either. And in order to ultimately really and truly prevent harassment and create a positive work environment, people have to be stepping in for each other and standing up for themselves and for each other. So addressing negative behaviors is a triple win. So for example, if you were to coach a workplace bully, they become a lot more effective. So if you have workplace bullies who are high producers, as uh, one person said that their bully was, um, why not make them more effective than they already are? I mean, how cool would that be? So, so coaching them makes them more effective than they already are. Um, so they're winners the people around them are less anxious and more productive. And then the organization is better protected from liability. And that means that you can sleep at night. Cause I know in HR, we get nervous about what's happening in the organization. Um, a culture built on respect is really and truly your best defense against harassment. Stop focusing on policy and training. That's compliance. It's not harassment prevention. You have to build a culture focused on respect if you're truly going to prevent harassment. Nothing bad has ever come out of a positive work environment. So what are you waiting for? No more excuses. You owe it to your employees to create a positive and healthy work environment. 